You're listening to Conversations in Atlantic Theory, a podcast dedicated to books and ideas generated from and about the Atlantic world. In collaboration with the Journal of French and Francophone Philosophy, these conversations explore the cultural, political, and philosophical traditions of the Atlantic world, ranging from European critical theory to the Black Atlantic to sites of indigenous resistance and self-articulation, as well as the complex geography of thinking between traditions, inside traditions, and from positions of insurgency, critique, and counter-narrative. Today's discussion is with Zayad El Nabolsi, Pierre Philippe Fratur, and Grant Ferret about the forthcoming edited collection entitled Africana Studies, Theoretical Futures, to be published by Temple University Press in late spring 2021. Zayad El Nabolsi is a doctoral student in the Africana Studies Department at Cornell University, where he works on African iterations of philosophy, culture, and Marxism in a continental and global intellectual context, and has authored a piece on political economy and African philosophy for the volume under discussion. Pierre-Philippe Frater, the author of the volumes afterward, is professor in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at the University of Warwick, and writes on philosophy and cultural theory with particular emphasis on Francophone Africa, including Past and Perfect, Time and African Decolonization, 1945 to 1960, which was published in 2021 by Liverpool University Press. Grant Farad, the editor of Africana Studies Theoretical Futures, is professor of Africana Studies at Cornell University, where he writes and teaches philosophy, cultural studies, and literature in a Black Atlantic context. Grant is the author of a number of books, including most recently, An Essay for Ezra, Racial Terror in America, published by University of Minnesota Press in late 2021. Grant, Pierre-Philippe, Zad, welcome. It's good to see you and hear you all today. Thank you for making the time to get together to chat about this uh, forthcoming at this time, uh, but soon to be out a collection of essays on Africana studies and their theoretical futures. Um, Grant, I know you've put this together and um, I'm a contributor, uh, obviously, but I really appreciate this project. I think it's really well-timed and that the essays in this really make some provocative and compelling contributions to thinking about the future of, of Africana studies and Africana theory. And I wanted to start off with a question specifically for you, Grant, um, about the origins of this project. You know, we write books because we have something to say. Perhaps we write books sometimes for a bit of vanity, but editing projects are different. They don't have the same kind of, um, you know, they, they, they are a service to the world of ideas. And so I think always with that comes a particular kind of motivation. You know, what, why this project now? Why put in your time and energy into it? So I'm curious to hear you sort of narrate a little bit how this project came about and why you thought it was an important one to take on. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I'm glad we have three contributors. I'm sorry, Miss Saad can't be here, but um, she's traveling from a warm place, and my sympathies are somewhat limited. Um, <laughs> yeah. Editing is a very particular kind of work. And, you know, I'm sure most of us have done it um, either as editors or as co editors, certainly as contributors. Um, and it's mainly ungrateful work, I think. It feels like it's work in the service of a larger project. The good thing about Africana Studies Theoretical Futures is it was in no way burdensome. Um, and edited collections tend to sort of follow a certain kind of arithmetical logic, which is to say you always get one contributor or two contributors who can make your life really difficult this was um this was jackpot you know um everybody was really cooperative and happy to be part of the project and you know, people met deadlines it wasn't like you know pulling teeth that doesn't answer the question though which is you know why well 
in part because Africana Studies, which is you know my primary home at Cornell, um, it's in that moment Africana Studies in general. You know, it's fifty going on fifty five, maybe sixty years old now, mm-hmm. and it seemed a good moment for reflection, just to understand what had happened. But I would have to say my impulse, my motivation, and my point of critical departure was, what now? Mm -hmm. I knew one thing, it was not going to be a celebration of what had been. Um, I wanted it, and I think it's turned out that way, to be a break with what had been. In other words, it wasn't about um, wiping the slate clean. It was just what do we do now? Mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. what's the next step? How do we think about this project? And to that end, I was fortunate in that I was able to draw on folks whose work I have, whose work I have regard for. And, you know, so everybody here is included in that. But I also wanted to get a sense of generational um yeah generational difference i suppose genealogy yeah. may be the obvious word for it, but i wanted to get folks who are established folks who are poised in that moment of their career where you know they're going from associate to full and they're just you know they're taking the next step mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then i wanted to get graduate students it seemed to me that that conversation the conversation couldn't take place without these different generational voices making their themselves heard um and you know it might have been um more conflagrational if there'd been ideological differences they weren't Mm -hmm. and i also wanted to draw from a range of voices um in terms of discipline like let people do what they want they were it seems to me the best way to um have people do their work is is to force them out of their comfort zone um Mm -hmm. and i especially wanted that from you know, the folks who were either associates and poised or those folks who are, you know, they're in the mature phase of their career. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for the graduate students, I, this was an opportunity to showcase their work and to operate in terms of, you know, the disciplines and the line, their line, the line of thinking with which they're most familiar. Mm-hmm. And I think we were able to accomplish that. You know, um, yeah. people did things that, they wouldn't ordinarily do and even when they did do stuff that they you know are more or less associated with there was a there was an angle to it there was a a certain kind of edge and Mm -hmm. i wanted those voices to be in conversation with each other and not always harmonious i just wanted these voices to have a platform to express themselves um and in that way, I think that the volume, you know, that may be why there was so little um, tendentiousness or, you know, I wasn't mm-hmm, dragging mm-hmm. things out of people. And, and, the, so and I, I really appreciate that, that uh, generational diversity. I mean, I think that's absolutely essential because, you know, as you said, sort of 50 years as a monumental, you know, you know number and a, a sort of moment to reflect, but it's also an expanse that draws out some of those, I don't, you know, maybe generational differences is too strong, but certainly the different shades that come uh, to the approach to the field, you know, across generations. And I, you know, I mean, it, so maybe that's a, a transition. This is a question for, I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on it. Um, you know, because the title of the book and the subtitle of the book is Really, I mean, on the one hand, it's a very simple title, subtitle, Africana Studies, Theoretical Futures. Um, and I'm curious about how, how you all think about the relationship between those, right? Africana Studies, 50 plus years old, an interdisciplinary field, an emerging field to study, and frankly, a field that's been dominated by empirical history and social science um, across time. And I certainly think, you know, in the United States, that's sort of a, a positivist oriented sort of culture, you know, those, those abide uh, and take up a lot of space, but then the subtitle theoretical futures, 
is itself really interesting that it's it's a volume really dedicated to thinking about Africana studies as Africana theory and pointing towards a future. But thinking about theoretical futures is about, you know, a relationship to the past, to the present, that sense of, you know, a, a critique in the present having a sort of prophetic function of opening up different kinds of futures. And so for me, I just sort of wonder about in this moment of reckoning with the field, you know, what does it mean to think Africana studies and Africana theory together? You know, how does that, how do you, how do you all see that disrupting the field, opening it up, deepening it, you know, how, how to configure that? Maybe uh, Pierre-Philippe, uh, get us started. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, I agree with you that there's, uh, there's probably a, a bit of a discrepancy between uh, how we see uh, African studies on the one hand and um, its theoretical uh, dimensions. And I think that by highlighting the um, importance of empirical studies in Afri Africana studies, you know, you sort of pointed out the fact that um, there is probably a dearth of, of, of um, theoretical criticism within uh, what, what, what we do. However, mm -hmm. what, what I think is also very important is this um, uh, the temporal and generational dimension that you have, that you had mentioned. Uh, what, um, what I found really striking, you know, when uh, sort of looking at the, the different contributions in, in this book is the fact that um, we, you know, as, as scholars from, from, from different horizons, because we, we, we have, you know, scholars from the US, Africa, and, 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 and the UK here, we, we all tend to uh, tap into a repository of, of thinkers. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that Fanon is, is, is a good example uh, of thinkers who uh, for the past 50 years plus have accompanied um, um, a theoretical uh, trajectory and, and, and journey of, of, of thinkers uh, out there. And mm -hmm. um, what I like about this book is the fact that um, canonical names, as it were, you know, were, um, have been, were used to um, examine very contemporary issues and mm -hmm. also you know envisage um, a, a, a future for this for this um, um, a critical uh, arena mm -hmm. uh, this is what strikes me most in in in, in this book um, beyond its um, multidisciplinary uh, dimension and also um, ability on part of the different contributors to um, establish intermedial uh, connections between mm -hmm. music, thought, uh, poetry, uh, cinema, uh, and this is quite. It is, and, and this is quite unique. I think the, the, this ability to um, to assert, if you want, that ultimately, you know, there's, there's also a very committed dimension, politically committed, I would say, dimension in this book. Uh, to assert, in other words, that the revolution, the revolution that was fought by um, some of the figures mentioned and, and mm -hmm. in, in this book, you know, I'm talking about the, uh, the Ruben and the Lubumba uh, mm -hmm. the, and, and the Che Guevara mentioned, you know, throughout um, this book. And actually, this book will be interesting as well from the point of view of the index. You know, I'm looking forward to mm. seeing this index. <laughs> yeah. Because it will sort of... A, it will show us, you know, who the the important figures are. But what is important yeah. is that this fight, this old revolutionary fight, you know, is sort of a reignited uh, through uh, contemporary uh, figures. And um, talking about, you know, um, in his introduction, uh, Grant uh, said that this project was, or you you did rather, uh, John, that it was well timed. Couldn't be better timed when you think when you think of what has happened in, in, in the US in the past, in the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, this is how I would, how I would frame the, the debate. 
Mm-hmm. Zayed, I'm interested in, in how you think about Africana studies and Africana theory together. I mean, I want to talk, uh, I have a couple of questions about your particular essay um, for later on, but, you know, your own engagement in the volume is is sort of across that Africana studies as sort of uh, history, political economy, but is also deeply theoretical. I mean, dealing with it's a, it's a philosophical text at its most key points. So, but just in sort of broad terms, how do you think this sort of Africana studies, Africana theory together? Uh, y- yes. So I, I, I think one uh, really interesting question, uh, uh, which, which arose for me as I sort of thought about um uh, the book as a whole, and maybe you know uh, what I can contribute is is this question of the relationship between <clears throat> uh, Africana studies as maybe uh, a site for the testing of theories, uh, mm-hmm. but maybe historically also sometimes not taken as a site for the generation of theories, um, and this is specifically I'd say the case also. Uh, And the African studies angle, I mean, you see this very clearly. I mean, there is a manner in which, for example, I would say it's not unfair to say that African studies has largely neglected African philosophy. Um, Not even criticized it, ignored it, you know, just sort of. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, I was really interested in in thinking of Africana studies as a site where we can generate theories, which might be, you know, these theories might perhaps be false or inadequate, but still to think of it as a space for generating uh, conceptual frameworks was Mm -hmm. for me uh, uh, really, really important in in the way I uh, I thought uh, about what this volume is doing as a whole. Um, Yeah, so so, so that sort of... uh, what, what my, my primary orientation in this context. So, Grant, I wanted to ask you this question about the relationship between Africana studies and Africana theory, but maybe frame it a little bit in terms of what uh, 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 motif you come back to in your introduction uh, repeatedly, which is this question of the creation of concept and what you call conceptual persona. So I'm wondering how you think about Africana study and Africana theory together around this issue of the career? Uh, let me answer that question by admitting something, which is in the original introduction that I wrote and actually submitted for review, I, um, <clears throat> I deflected and I gestured quite extensively in the direction of Pierre Philippe because you know, as I, as I said to him, and I say in the um, in the introduction itself, it's a sublime piece of work. I mean, he just gets everything, and it's wonderfully organized, and it's an imaginative piece of mm-hmm. of writing, Absolutely. which you know I thrill to. Uh, but I said something like, you know, two and a quarter pages. The beginning is in the end, and I was hoping I'd be able to get away with that, but mm-hmm. um, clearly the uh, the readers were not happy. And, and that was fine because it gave me an opportunity to go back to something. Mr. Nab- Mr. El Nabalsi said, um, you know, African studies doesn't take African philosophy seriously. Um, I, I'm sure there's a certain kind of truth to that, but I've also been around and, you know, there's at least one of the people in this volume who might have been around for a while now. And, you know, we have in common a friend, um, Valentin Mudimbi. So, you know, Valentin is both my friend and and my colleague. He was my colleague for um, almost a decade at Duke. And I know Valentin, you know. Um, we've had many a conversation, and he's a very particular man. Um, so I've seen Valentin's work. So I don't have the same kind of concerns that Mr. Elna Balsi has. And, um, you know, Pierre Philippe can speak to this because we've had you know, conversations around Valentin. And, you know, he's done a, an amazing um, collection of Valentin's work. So for, for those anxieties don't come into play for me because I, I've seen this intellectual. And, and the amazing thing about him and, you know, um, the people assembled here, two of whom are present, was that they, they take that work and they do something with it. Uh-huh. Right? There's no... There is no anxiety about the sources. 
There's no provincialism. There's no tribalism. There's no Bantustan of ideas. We just draw on things. And for me, there's a certain liberation in that. Yeah. Having said that, um, you point out quite correctly a tension between Africana studies, which is the title, and then the subtitle, which is theoretical futures. Now, somewhere, and I think this may be in his letter, yeah, in fact, that he's on his, in his letter on humanism, Heidegger makes this distinction. He says um, philosophy is abstraction, it's thinking. Theory is application. Um, I've always felt like that's at best a little dicey, right? Like, and, and hard <laughs> to sustain. But that's not surprising. This is Heidegger after all. Yeah. But what I wanted, what I wanted here, was to render that distinction null and void. I wanted to say, and you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I did not say this in my invitation to all of the contributors, but here's an opportunity to just think about what matters to you in this moment. Yes. So draw on whatever you want, write in whatever way you want. And I think Pierre Philippe's right. There are a certain number of canonical figures, but for me, the, um, the real juice, the, the meat of the matter, is that many of these people are not canonical, right? Yeah. And, and that's what I love about it. People just went out there and they wrote and they explored things that mattered to them. And I think for me, that's what matters, um, is the refusal of disciplinarity without um you know some kind of objection to what those canonical figures may have done mm -hmm. you know um uh, i'm much more interested in what we can do rather than getting stuck on what we um have done what we haven't done and that always just seems to me to take up so much time and energy, the kind of delineation of failure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, I, I, you know, I hope I gave people carte blanche. I was interested to know what people across a range of generations have to say about what work not only needs to be done, but wor what work they can do. So I, I tried to make note of Heidegger's distinction between thinking and application. Um, because I, it seems to me that if one spends all one's time either trying to acknowledge the past or, you know, genuflect in the direction of certain figures and Hanan is one of those figures that we seem to come to, I guess my question is, what are we not doing? Right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and here the opportunity was exactly the opposite. Please have at it. And, and so the volume for me is in that way, as I said, you know, thrilling. Nowhere more so than in that that in that um in, in Pierre Philippe's afterward, but it was it was one an attempt to sort of negate Heidegger's, Heidegger's distinction, but equally importantly, equally important I suppose to say to people, what kind of work do you think matters in this moment, and then to be able to produce that work not because it's definitive or final and nothing ever is, but as an opportunity to open up into what might be. And I think that's uh, absolutely crucial. I mean, it's part of what I love about the volume is that it's not a sort of history of the field or something like that. I mean, I, I know it's not something that probably any of us would have been a part of um, just in terms of, of motivations and energy. But, you know, I think that subtitle, Theoretical Futures, it does really do that work of, of you know, if we're thinking what is Africana studies, this is a volume that does Africana studies in that theoretical register. And in that way, you know, I thought about a lot about the, this invocation of creation of concepts, which I think is such an essential part of how we, um, how we ought to be doing philosophical work. But it's also one of these things where the creation of concepts is also captures, I think something of the, the animating spirit of the field, right? As always being in this moment of invention, which I never take to be an, merely an expression of precarity in terms of sort of professional life or intellectual life. 
um, but instead is is the power of the field, which is its capacity to combine and recombine, you know, figures, ideas in this uh, mode of invention. And I think the volume captures that in the introduction, I think in that way is a big theoretical piece that does a really excellent framing of, of the way the essays unfold. And, you know, when I, you know, in this is a sort of next question, um, you know, in, in that sense of combination and invention, one of the things that does also strike me about the collection is that obviously it's Africana studies, theoretical futures. It is about the, the, the problematics of Africa and the Black Atlantic, the sort of geographies of thought that come from that, you know, the key, you know, key thinkers or, or key epistemological and ontological issues. But there's also a lot of engagement with white European thinkers and the formative concepts that come from those traditions. And I'm not interested in this sort of like, you know, who's good, who's bad, who's permissible, who's not, but rather what the kind of engagement that happens in these particular essays, like what that might say about the coming decades of Africana theory and how we ought to understand um, the racial cultural politics of citation and engagement moving forward. Because I do think there are habits in the field which are tend to be a kind of ethno-racial nationalism in terms of citation, which has a, an, an ethical claim that I think we ought to take seriously. But I think this volume also demonstrates a different kind of relationship to uh, European thinkers. And I, you know, I would be curious to hear uh, everyone's thoughts uh, on that. Maybe uh, Zayad. Uh, yes, of course. Um... Yeah, I, I guess if I if I would attempt to answer this question, I would say, uh, broadly speaking, uh, if we just speak in, in theoretical terms, um, I I think there is no justification for a standpoint that implicitly assumes that somehow, uh, um, latter latter day descendants i guess of uh, european peoples have some kind of monopoly on on what we can consider like uh, the classical european canon or something for speaking about mm -hmm. philosophy for mm -hmm. instance uh because I, I i mean i think that's 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 actually one of <clears throat> uh the myths of of sort of uh, european or, or white supremacy there is you know there is no uh argument that would allow one to 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 justify the claim that somehow only people writing on specific issues from a specific place can can grasp this canon i mean and, and this is sort of reflected in you know the way philosophers have thought about the history of philosophy in general there's this idea that you know frequently we understand the ancients better than they understand themselves so i mean i i think we can approach it from uh, this angle um and for me, I, again, it's it's the issue of sort of thinking, at least for me, if I, I do uh, African intellectual history, is really just emphasizing that, you know, um, the African continent is part of global history. And yeah. you have these African thinkers, whether in late antiquity, in the medieval period, in the early modern period, modern period, contemporary period, they're drawing on these different sources. And uh, they have a claim to be heard in terms of how they interpret these sources. They might be wrong. Again, this is not the issue of, uh, deifying thinkers or anything like that, but to just, you know, mm -hmm. if, if someone is trying to understand Aristotle's reception and doesn't deal with the reception of uh, Aristotle in North Africa and West Africa, then there is an inadequacy in this account simply uh, just by, by the canons of, of intellectual mm -hmm. history. Uh, so, so that would be my approach. Yeah, I mean, I think of, you know, two, um, two, uh, cases that are sort of two articulations of this that come to mind. I mean, Senghor, just after World War II, talked about his own um, engagement with, with French thought, mostly sort of life philosophy. And, you know, his response is basically, I mean, it, I, I think it's contrary, it's a very different response than people might expect from a sort of robust uh, position of negritude. But he's like, you know, African thought has nothing to fear from contact with European thought, you know, we are not weak, right? And it's part of the sort of decolonization of that relationship, where even just, you know, prior to independence um, in Senegal, he's already talking about assimilation as not assimilation to the colonial ideal, but the assimilation of, of European thought into an African um, 
uh, self-articulation or in the poetics in his case, or Derek Walcott, you know, who, who defended his use of English, not in a defensive mode, but really, I think in an offensive mode of, you know, why would English, the language English be the property of the English, right? It's a global language and, and we across the globe do with it what we want. And these are, you know, I thought of these, these, uh, two, uh, sort of interventions in the question, I mean, uh, separated by, I think, 50 years. But, you know, when you were talking, Zed, I, it, it came to mind. Uh, Pierre-Philippe and Grant, I'm curious what you all think about this particular issue. Yeah, no, thanks, John. I think it's a fascinating one. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful to Grant for mentioning, you know, our sort of mutual um, acquaintance or friends, V.Y. Mudimbe, because... Um, Moody May's work has also been driven and uh, animated by these issues of um, ontological identities, of mm-hmm. um, vernacular uh, languages, of global languages or not. And what do you do when um, you have inherited, I suppose, you know, uh, several epistemologies um, and um, several languages, and it, it is certainly his his position. It was certainly his position as a as a Congolese who who knows several Congolese languages, um, who was uh, brought up as a as a as a Benedictine priest, who was you know completely francophonized as he said by the age of eighteen, and then you know had a successful career in Belgium, France, and, and the U.S., of course, uh, Duke University. And he has been able, if you want, to sort of uh, um, seize, you know, all these sort of linguistic and, 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 and cultural um, opportunities. And, you know, what I like about what, what he has done is that we are completely away from what Grant was talking about when he said Bantustan and, and sort of a ontological fixity of... Uh, why does he? Because of course, in the meantime, he has been criticised heavily by a lot of Africana philosophers for not um, drawing, you know, exclusive, exclusively on um, African modes of, of 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 knowledge production and and African um, epistemologies. But you know, I also think that in many ways, you know, English. French uh, are sort of African languages, and that they have that they have this power to uh, revolutionize from inside. You know, um, the old it's it's not it's not a novel idea, but the old colonial uh, idioms, and 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 they have done so very successfully. And and actually, if you read Budimbe's English, you know, it's in itself. Yeah. You know, because it's. In itself, it's a it's a performance, it's a literary performance because it it doesn't um, adhere to uh, to to the canon. So um, I, I find this really interesting, you know. Uh, this and this issue is is really at the at the heart of what we should endeavor to do. Uh, you know, just sort of in that vein, there's a part of me that's exhausted by that question. Yeah, I know um, that. The, the <laughs> I was question, asking it anyway. <laughs> you know, the question, the question of archive, the question of canon and canonicity. Um, I like to understand myself as somebody belonging to a generation that is completely emancipated from that. But if I'm not, let me offer um, a paradox. In At the end of The Souls of Black Folk, um, W.B. Du Bois says, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Right? Which is, I have a full claim on modernity. Here's my claim. No apologies. There's a wonderful line in C.L.R. James' Beyond the Boundary, <clears throat> excuse me, when he says, Zachary, not Marx, bears the heaviest responsibility for me. We're talking here about, you know, two of the premier figures in, if there is an Africana Studies canon, they'd certainly figure in it. 
Absolutely. <laughs> so they are quite happy to make their claim. And when people study them, those lines get overlooked. Those claims are frequently ignored. And I think you called it ethno-nationalism. Okay, so that's the one side of the paradox. Here's the other. Derrida, Hegel, Kant, all these major European philosophers have no problem invoking St. Augustine. And how's that possible, right? Yeah. I mean, I speak as a recovering Catholic, which means that, you know, you never recover. But Augustine has given everybody this body of literature to which we can stake a claim. Yes. You know, Augustine is closer geographically and geopolitically to Mr. Elna Balsi than he is technically to Pierre Philippe. So Augustine is fine for people, right? But we can't read other people. Um, you know, my answer is an impatient one. I have no truck with it. Um, and yes something we must remember about the archive, and, and particularly in this moment of the internet. Um, the archive, if it's not used properly, will always affirm, it will always affirm. You can always find in the archive what you want. That means for me that the archive has failed. The archive only succeeds when you find yourself confronted by something you did not expect. The archive has to surprise. I mean, yeah. it's like, you know, there are 850,000 people who've written to the king of Sweden, please, King Gustav, why have I not yet been awarded my Nobel Prize in immunology? Right? Because <laughs> these people have all found what they needed on the internet. Right? They've all found affirmation. Again, the archive fails if it doesn't surprise. And I'm going to take this moment, please interrupt me if you think fit, John, to say this about the, um, you know, about the introduction. Like I said, I wrote one introduction. It didn't work, even though it's still poetically in my head. And I just happened to be reading for a completely different project, Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to find those things. I was also at the same time listening to Anjali Kidjil and um, Celia Cruz. And, of course, you know, to Fela. Now, those things coming together is completely an accident. But I think those accidents are fortuitous, they're productive, they're generative. But they only come about if there is an intellectual openness. In other words, if one is willing to be surprised. So let me return to the terms of the paradox. If we agree that St. Augustine is all of ours, then, you know, like James and Du Bois, I find these weird connections, concatenations, echoes, resonances. And to be quite frank, that for me is the joy of the work. You know, I think the joy that people take, I think Mr. Elna Bolsi is, is a very serious piece, but I hope he had fun writing it. But, you know, um, you know your piece is mischievous. I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to give Pierre Philippe any more props, um, you know, because I, I think I've done my due diligence by him. But, you know, I get the sense that he enjoyed writing that. And so I don't always want my work to be overburdened by some sense of, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You know, I don't want my work to be overburdened by some sense of genuflection in the direction of a canonical, canonical figure or a set of text. Um, I really want to be surprised and to open up possibilities. Because if we just affirm, then really, we've given up on thinking. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things that comes to mind in, in uh, across all these concepts is, you know, Glissant makes this this distinction or this you know comment, which to me is both a sort of banal observation in the sense of it's very familiar to me, but I think it's potentially really transformative where he says the West is not a place, it's a project. And part of the West being a project means some of these 
kinds of anxieties are opened up exactly by reconfiguring the project of thinking. And when we reconfigure that project of thinking, and that's part of why this creation of concepts uh, from from Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy is, is so interesting and compelling to me, is it actually just opens up that sense of project so that the West, whatever the West is, right, it's always been a project such that, you know, the ancient Greeks and Augustine can be like, you know, little Americans going to vote at their, you know, YMCA, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's essentially what I think that that sense of the project has become. And I think the volume, you know, I asked this question about, about the sort of racial politics of citation, not because I think it's a problematic part of the volume, but because I think it's exactly one of the things the volume opens up so well, which is the productive character of these kinds of, of, creative spaces that are dedicated as you as you put it grant and you you say it all the time you know dedicated to thinking to the project of thinking rather than uh the project of sort of reifying old projects um so let me ask uh uh zad about your essay um you know one of the things i thought was really interesting about it and i remember sort of browsing through it before sort of the way i read i sort of scan it and then go back and read it and you know your essay deals with so many of the motifs of political economy which in so many cases is dominated by a kind of empirical approach to history and 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 uh, and economy but it's so infused with um theoretical work right and so i want to hear you talk a little bit about how you think your essay does work both um with african philosophy but also with phenomenology and critical theory althusser and husserl to open up some of the theoretical dimensions of political political economy in such a way that it it liberates all the accomplishments of political economy uh from its its obsession with the empirical Right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's a really uh, important question. So I, I I think one way I approached it is um, thinking about a specific problem. So as a specific subject matter, the question of <clears throat> uh, these debates about the place of uh, African philosophy, uh, both in in uh, in its uh, aspect as, you know, academic philosophy, something done in uh, research universities, but also its place in sort of wider debates about African culture, about indigeneity, modernity, you know, the, these kinds of uh, standard, I guess, problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and, and to go back to Grant's point about sort of the archives are, uh, surprising us, I mean, this is one of the things that happened. I was just reading Hontonji, and Hontonji is usually cast as a critic of ethno-philosophy when people narrate the history of African philosophy, you know, specifically Francophone uh, African philosophy. He gets cast as, as that, you know, uh, that person. But I, I realized reading his later work that he developed this very... For me, I found it strange interest in the sociology of scientific knowledge in the peripheries, uh, uh, and, and the peripheries understood in the kind of dependency theory context, the kind of core uh, slash metropole and periphery, uh, or new colony, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, again, this was sort of something surprising, and I, I, I attempted to make sense of it in a way uh, where I would just look at what the problem was uh, and neglect these sort of disciplinary boundaries, because I think this is sort of... Uh, one of the strengths of Africana studies is that, that, yes, most of us have a specific disciplinary angle, or perhaps two, uh, from which we approach problems. But you can take the problem on its own terms, and then you don't even have to have a kind of methodological uh, <clears throat> uh, discussion that will justify you sort of transgressing specific disciplinary boundaries. I sort of adopted a, an approach that said, this is the problem, these are the elements that are required. And so with respect to the point about political economy, uh, so one, one criticism, uh, and here what I found sort of, I was thinking originally of what does Hampton G take from his reading of dependency theorists like Samir Amin, for example, who he engaged with, uh, both in Benin and in Senegal. Uh, but then I started thinking, what does Hampton G give dependency theory back? Uh, and I think one of the things he does very clearly 
uh, even if he does not frame it explicitly in this way, is that a common uh, a standard criticism of dependency theory was that it had no account of, I guess, what uh, in Marxist lingo uh, or Marxist jargon we would call the superstructure. It had no account of these cultural yeah. formations. It had no account of something like science, for example. And I think Quantum G does provide maybe perhaps the framework that would enable us to uh, flesh out this element of dependency theory. Uh, and to this extent, I found it interesting the the, the mutual uh, uh, fertilization that, that sort of took place uh, across these approaches. Uh, so dependency theory giving Quantum G something, Quantum G giving something back to it, African philosophy giving something back to that. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know uh, if I should rant any longer, but uh, maybe if there is a follow-up uh, or something. No, that, it's not a rant at all. That was, that was fantastic. I mean, I think that, you know, I like the, you know, the invocation of superstructure as this absolutely crucial uh, way of understanding um, the problematics of political economy in an Africana studies context. I mean... Yeah, I think your essay in in particular, although it's true of of, of many of the essays, uh, really embody that sense of not being beholden to particular methodologies and the sort of stuff that that opens up because it does open up uh, uh, up a lot uh, phenomenologically. You know, and your you know Husserl being you know uh, a part of that kind of conversation, I think that's important. It gives that sense of ideological Althusser and just phenomenological richness to the questions that political economy and sort of Marxist interventions and thinking about dependency theory in Africa. Um, I, you know, I, I love the essay for that. I, I felt like the sorts of things I wasn't sure um, how to engage in a full sense around dependency theory right? Political economy, really the, your essay opens that up. And if Africana studies works in that vein, I would, I would absolutely love to see that as part of its future. Uh, Pierre Philippe. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, something quickly about the arts, um, chapter, which I really liked too, uh, you know, for, for personal reasons, because you know, I have read, uh, Hunting G, but I really like the way in which you look at this, um, uh, again, fraught relationship between science on the one hand and, and theoretical science, more precisely, and application. And uh, often, as you say, you know, there seems to be, uh, the, the, the um, application seems to be um, stemming from uh, theoretical, or seems to be regarded to stem from uh, theoretical uh, science, when in truth, you know, uh, things are, are, are different. And I, I really like the way in which you sort of uh, challenge, you know, this this dichotomy. Thank you. Can I say something briefly? Yeah, as absolutely, a, as a, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think, and this is sort of one aspect of uh, uh, the, the problem when it's carried out, when the discussion is often carried out at a purely philosophical level uh, about the relationship between philosophy and science, for example, is that we neglect all of these findings by historians of science, which might seem sort of very mundane and very boring. You know, somebody went and studied the life of James Watt for 20 years or something. Uh, but then you, you precisely discover th these relationships between, you know, the steam engine pre preceding, for example, the theoretical system of thermodynamics. Uh, and then, then we can bring these elements and actually give concrete cases. So, and that again was mm -hmm. something I found surprising, which I, I really, I, and this was something I really enjoyed to go to, go to the enjoyment question or non-enjoyment. Thank you. Yeah, I, this, these, I think it's, it's interesting to see this conversation sort of surfacing issues of surprise and, and pleasure. Uh, in in research and writing, uh, as well as creation, right? Creation of concepts, and maybe that's a, a way to transition to a question I had. For, uh, one question I had for you, Pierre Philippe, which is more of a sort of invitation to reflect on uh, something, which is your use of this phrase "world making endeavor," right? And that was it stood out to me because it was an interesting sort of bookend to Grant's introduction invoking the creation of concepts. So it's this like creation and making concepts and world. 
So I would just I wanted to invite you to, to, to talk a little bit or reflect a little bit on that phrase, world making endeavor and um, how you think it plays out across the volume or just in the very idea of the volume even, uh, because it really sets the stakes of the collection high. It's saying, you know, we are, t- we are making an intervention in, in a world making endeavor. Um, well, thank, thanks, John. Maybe first of all, you know, I should make, I should say a few words about, uh, you know, the, in a way, the conceptual difficulties that I experienced uh, when, um, when, uh, when, when Grant asked me to, uh, to write uh, this afterwards. Uh, it's, I, I'm, I must add here that I had never written an afterword, you know, uh, hitherto. Uh, and so I felt, um, I felt quite responsible. You know, for this, for this um, thing that I was that I was sort of asked to uh, to uh, to produce, um, I so yeah, a huge responsibility, um, and literally I felt also that I had to respond. You know, because of this responsibility, I had to respond to the words that had been uttered by the different contributors in 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 their chapters. So the task for me was. Uh, was um, quite um, challenging, I would say. Um, and then, um, but then, you know, implicitly, and and also very explicitly in some in some cases, um, I realized that all the chapters were engaged in the dismantling of colonial and neo-colonial cartographies, um, literary, mm-hmm. cultural, artistic. Um, cartographies. You know, we, we have been talking about the about canonical figures, but it seemed that all the the, the, the chapters in this in this volume are sort of um, somewhat uh, directly or indirectly engaged with this um, challenging um, exercise. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, and of course, you know, uh, the the added difficulty. Is the the diversity of the of the themes and topics and issues covered by by the contributors? You know, philosophy, thought. You know, whether there's a difference between philosophy and and thought, literature, music, political science, political philosophy, and uh, vi- the visual arts as well. And so um, I thought that uh, um, to sort of come back to the world making endeavor. Uh, expression Hello? that um, most contributors also were sort of um, dialoguing with um, our world you know mm-hmm. uh, you mentioned the west you know whether whether the west is a reality or a, a project with our world our first world and um, what you call john in your in your own chapter small small places mm-hmm. and what I, I I wouldn't want to conflate what I say in my necessarily what I say in my um, afterward and what you say in your in your own chapter, but in my own chapter I talked about um, the the small context, drawing yeah. on uh, Shamazo's uh, work as a as a novelist, and mm-hmm. Shamazo's Shamazo argues in that piece, which is a, an interview that he that he gave in 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 in, in you know about 10 years ago, that literature, you know, has no, has no mission. Uh, you know, there has no real mission. But however, what, what he tries to do in his own work is to sort of connect his small context, that mm-hmm. of Martinique, with the wider world uh, out there. And um, now I'm not saying that this model is replicated in, in all the chapters, but I, what I wanted to uh, say and 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 um, and show uh, by using uh, world making endeavor is that uh, the contributors in this Africana volume uh, somewhat, you know, uh, managed to um, establish um, a, a dialogue between uh, our first world and other other worlds uh, out there, and um, and that this confrontation between um, different worlds and different life worlds as well um, would 
um, contribute to um, world making and even world remaking. So it, essentially, this is what I, I, I was trying to, uh, mm-hmm. to to prove, not to prove, but to show and, and quite loosely, I must say. But it's, it's a very interesting question that you're asking me. Uh, a year uh, after you know this piece was written as <laughs> yeah. well which is which is an, an added complication uh, um, i suppose but essentially and, uh, this is what i was trying what i was aiming at in uh, by by using uh, that phrase and i you know it's interesting the way you structure the afterword you know witnessing is is a, a a centerpiece and is you know in some ways you've already been talking about that which is a deeply ethical and even political um evocation but you talk about witnessing or sort of build towards witnessing in the afterward around these embodied and thoughtful you know th- full of thought uh uh subtitles right seeing hearing breathing and so maybe just a, f- a few words about that. And I, I mean that specifically in, in, the ca- in the frame that we've been talking about, right? This is this idea of, of, of theoretical futures in which this location in the body of, 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 of seeing, hearing, and breathing is evoked while we're also talking about the vulnerable state of witnessing, but the way that witnessing is also a transformation in the midst of neo-colonial machinations and the aftermath of slavery and colonialism. And so really, it's just a question, you know, what, uh, what made you f- structure that afterward in terms of these sort of thoughtful notions of embodiment? Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Again, I, I think that this was predicated on uh, the responsibility that I felt as a, as someone who had been asked to write um, uh, an afterword, um, I think that by reading you know, the different contributions, I sort of felt that these um, sensorial uh, processes were important mm-hmm. and were um, to a large extent as well at the heart of what the contributors were, 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 were trying to be, to be doing in their, in, in, in their pieces. Um, um, the, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the different, at these, at the concatenation of, of this title, seeing, hearing, breathing, and, and lit, witnessing less so, but certainly the first three are sort of uh, linked to uh, biology. And mm, to mm-hmm. to the organic, and yeah. to what we are, you know, fundamentally as as humans, and, and this is and this is what I wanted. I suppose that it's probably the phenomenological um, dimension uh, of what I wanted to sort of convey here. Um, the um, the experience experiencing colonialism, uh, experiencing slavery, experiencing neo colonialism experiencing um, a decolonial present in, in the US and, and, and beyond is something that one does with one's uh, senses. And, mm-hmm. and of course, uh, you know, breathing is, is beyond senses. You know, it's even more fundamental than, than seeing, seeing and, and, and hearing. And as you said, I suppose that the witnessing, you know, added after uh, these uh, first three terms, you know, is is the is the response and is the more sort of um, um, you 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 said uh, is the more sort of um, uh, thought um, provoking attempt to um, use one's um, judgment and 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 reasoning to uh, sort of uh, write back at mm-hmm. um, um, colonialism and um, neo-colonialism so that there, 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 there's a lot there's a lot here seeing you know i think that i explained you know how seeing as a as an activity visualism or oculocentrism you know mm-hmm. are um, were are and are still you know related to a, a taxonomic order which is still in use you know um, when, when in, in in the world that we inhabit mm-hmm. um, 
hearing, you know, on the other hand, you know, is probably a sense that has been sort of somewhat neglected in certainly in um, post-colonial studies and, and certainly in Africana studies. Um, but breathing, you know, takes us back to uh, what, what it is to be human and, and what, what it is to be um, experiencing, you know, crises with, with one's body. So and this is in a nutshell. It's quite, you know, I, I'm not claiming that there's any uh, sort of a, you know, grand and systematic plan, you know, behind the, sure, sure. The, these, <laughs> these words. But this is how I, I, I would uh, sort of position, position myself, really. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I will just say as a way of sort of wrapping up that, that is what you're saying is, mm. you know, seeing, hearing, breathing and witnessing they're embodied terms, right? An embodied presence to something. And one of the things that I think animates all of those is the capacity, this gets back to something Grant was talking about, the capacity to be surprised, right? There are ways of being vulnerable to not just the archive of, you know, um, Du Bois and James, where, you know, we mm. witness, hear, see Thackeray, Shakespeare, and how that resonates, but also, you know, I'm thinking of other, uh, other essays, um, to, uh, openness to sound and sound's mm -hmm. ability to transform, uh, mm -hmm. our relationship. And, you know, I think about small places, which I talked about in my, uh, my essay, or the theme of my essay and the way scent, right. And breath is such a part of, you know, what does it mean to be in a place? Um, so I think there, you know, I, what I liked about the afterword, I mean, I, you know, what is an afterword? I, I, that is something to, to, to think about, but I like the way it, it evoked, you know, that it was in the mode of the evocative. And I think in that evocative, it gathers together animating spirits across the volume. So I, I, I love that part. You know, I, I, I think afterwards should be in all edited volumes, you know, after, and I never think of it. And then I read it and I was like, these kinds of meta reflections and evocations, I think they're just really uh, fantastic ways to wrap up. And speaking of wrapping up, we may as well uh, wrap up this conversation. Um, and so <laughs> I hadn't intended that kind of uh, continuity in, in words, but um, I'll sort of go person by person. And it's just a very simple question of, of, you know, what in light of this volume, in light of this, you know, what we, the issues we've been talking about here, where does this collection leave, leave you as a thinker? You know, what's the sort of future of Africana theory? And I say that because Africana studies, yeah. Africana theory has always been over the last 50 something years has been a minor player in that. But I think that this volume gives a really good argument for the centrality of, of Africana theory. And so thinking about Africana studies and the theoretical futures, you know, where do you, what's your sort of final takeaway from this volume? And I'll sort of go person by person, start with uh, Zed. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so in, in, in terms of, um, I would say as, as a kind of uh, takeaway would be, um, sort of a, a more kind of confident approach to um, to just engaging in uh, Africana studies. Um, and I mean, one thing I really liked about um, um, this discussion is uh, the manner in which we, well, we had to talk about it a bit, but I think we succeeded in sidestepping questions like whether, you know, African philosophy exists and things like that, and, and sort of uh, anxieties about canonicity and... Uh, marginalization and i think in a, in a sense what we have to do is just do the work it's, it sounds banal but you know to, to kind of quote from uh hegel's uh, philosophy of right you know hick roads hick salta you know uh, you know roads is here jump here you have to just go uh, do it sort of in in, in the actual <coughs> conditions we're in right now pierre philippe yes um well Again, you know what what I liked in this book is its possibilities and its ability as a as a piece to um, create um, dialogues and 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 connections between uh, media and, and genres, and so. Um, Actually, you know, it sort of speaks to my, my current project, 
um, in which I am uh, sort of looking at extractivism in, in, in the Congo, in, in, in Central Africa, but from the point of view of philosophy, uh, the visual arts, and, and literature. So involving people like that I mentioned briefly, actually, in, in, the after, in my afterword, afterthought, um, Sinzo Anza, Fisto Mujila Monza, but also um, visual artists like Sami Baloji, Freddy Simba, and Michel Magema. So this, this, that would be my, 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 my takeaway. And Grant, this sort of brings us uh, sort of full circle to my first question about your motivations for the volume, which was about its its beginning. And, um, you know, as a Africana theory theorist or Africana studies theorist, uh, where do you think the volume leaves us, you know, in terms of what it accomplishment accomplishes and where it points us? You know, I tend to... Um be a glass half full kind of person. So my, my expectations are at best modest, you know, probably in truth subterranean. Um, but, but I don't know what the volume does because I think it'll take on its own life. Um, and that for me is, you know, its own possibility. It'll be in the world. We will have done our best. We have put this together. Now let it breathe, let it be in the world, right? Let somebody else to evoke Pierre Philippe, you know, bear witness to it. Um, and, you know, I make it a habit not to read reviews because it always seems to me that reviewers are reading a very different book from the one you intended to write. So, um, you know, I think the press will be glad of any kind of publicity, any kind of resonance. So that's one thing. And, um, I will return, you know, to something that I said. It was, I really enjoyed putting this together. Um, it wasn't a lot of work, but for me, the most important thing to come out of this is the following. Um, one is that I've learned in the course of my career to, um, you know, to trust certain kinds of people and to be open to collaborating with people whom, you know, whom I instinctively or intuitively sense I'll be able to work with. And so you, John, Pierre Philippe, um, Kasireka, you know, I've, I've worked with you guys before. This goes back, you and I go back 15 years. And the only reason I know Pierre Philippe, um, as well as Jean-Paul Martineau, is because I did a volume on Mudumbi and, you know, that opened up a conversation. And um, the reason I think we became colleagues and friends is that that review was full of good faith. Uh, and for me, that's really important, you know, that mm -hmm. one does one's work in good faith, that you you do everything you can, you put it out into the world and you let it live. But, you know, the premise of good faith is fundamental to me. So. As regards my relationship with you, Kasireka, Pierre Philippe, it was a deepening of, you know, um, intellectual exchange, and that's important. Um, with Akin, I've known him a long time. This felt like an opportunity to work with him in a different register, so it was that. But I also learned in graduate school, as, you know, this is Pierre Philippe's term as well, a certain kind of responsibility to the graduate student. And I had Mr. Al Nabolsi and Ms. Saad in a class. Ms. Tenberg worked with a colleague of mine. But I think it's very important that we provide opportunities for our graduate students in such a way that we do not infantilize them, that we simply treat them as scholars in training, as which is exactly what we are. So I wanted to provide that opportunity to... Um, you know, have them engage other people's work and see their work in relation to other people's. And that was very important to me because, um, you know, my line on graduate school is very simple. Find a single person whom you can trust, again, notions of good faith, and work with that person. Everything else is kind of incidental. Um, and, you know, Mr. El Nabolsi, good um, Calvinist that he is, right, said, 
because he comes from Hegel, right? Just, just do the work. Just do the work. That's it. You know, um, there is no thinking except in the writing. There is no writing except in the rewriting. And I think it's our responsibility as people at a certain slightly different mo moments in our career to present that to students. This is how you do your work. And then to trust them to do their work. So as much as anything, this volume for me was about providing an opportunity for a generation of scholars, um, only one of whom I work with closely, you know, and I, I felt like, yeah, they can do something, you know, yeah, they can be around other kinds of people, they can challenge their own work, they, you know, Mr. Alna Balsi said something completely unexpected to me, he said, um, I have to go and read Deleuze and Guattari now. I'm pretty sure they weren't on his reading list before. In fact, you know, I, I bet that. But, you know, you say this is how it's possible to do your work. And so for me, the volume is about creating conversations among different generations. It's about people finding pleasure in their work. And it was perhaps most importantly about just you know, doing away with anxieties about archives, traditions, and canons. I wanted to say, as people who have um, some stake, maybe some greater than others, in what Africana studies is, in where it might go, just have at it. Um, so it was about the opportunity to do one's work and to enjoy doing one's work and to see what kind of work other people are doing within that same context. Well, that's a fantastic uh, place for us to close up. I think that uh, I, I have to say, as uh, I was obviously a contributor, but I also uh, as soon as the page proofs came, became a reader of the collection. I do think it communicates that, you know, I think it communicates through generational diversity, um, the sort of range of curiosities in the field and that range of curiosities without restraint produces uh, really innovative and unique work. and. Um, you, uh, you know, you said you're a half uh, glass, half full person, um, you know, with the other half of the glass, I just uh, hope <laughs> with eyes on it that that other half of the glass uh, liberates theoretical thinking in the field a little bit, because I, I, I think it's some of the most anxiety ridden uh, uh, areas of scholarship. Um, and I think this volume absolutely breaks through that. I think you did a great job of assembling people and also emboldening voice and so, well, thanks to all three of you. I really appreciate you uh, making the time and having this conversation. And uh, I look you. forward to uh, hearing about the, the book. Maybe I'll be the one who reads the reviews if they come. <laughs> <laughs>